Okay, welcome to our presentation where I will be discussing what you need to uh, be looking into when looking at the customer segments part of your business model. And this is what you're going to be testing this week. So please pay attention and then try to apply what you've learned here and uh, over the week, do your research and then come back to class and tell us what you were expecting about your customer segments, what you thought you would find. And then when you went out and actually contacted those customer segments, what did you find out about them? So the customer segments review. First of all, quick reminder about why we're doing this, okay? Uh, well, as we've talked about before, there is a significant amount of failure in entrepreneurship uh, fortunately, it's, at, it's not as high as some of the uh, urban legends or internet legends out there are actually stating. For example, for the US, there seems to be about 20% failure rate in the first year. When you come out to three years, about one third have failed, two thirds are surviving. If you come out five years, it's about half and half. If you come out 10 years, about two thirds have failed but about one third are still in existence. So what that tells us is that um, the numbers you may have heard like 90% failure, 95% failure, fortunately are not true, okay? At least for the US. How about for Turkey? Do we have any numbers? Well, uh, yes, we, I've actually done some research with some of my uh, previous students. And by looking into the official Gazette, Tijari Sijil, and we have been able to find that uh, these seem to be the official survival rates for companies that have been established in 1990, 95, 2005, 2010, and 2015. So there seems to be two separations. One, before 2000, survival was slightly higher. And post 2000, it's dipped down a little bit, but both of them are significantly above the US rates. Okay. Uh, another time we may discuss why this is so, is this better or not? Right now, I'm just trying to state the facts that we know. So this is at five years. Before 2000, it looks like it was about 90% survival. Post 2000, it's a little above 80%. If you can amount to 10 years, where in the US, this was. 10 years, I guess, about one third survival. Uh, Pre-2000, it was around 80%. Post-2000, it seems to be around 65%, so about two thirds. So this is what we have. Yes, there is a significant amount of failure, but it's not as bad as a lot of the internet legends say it is. So what do we want to do? Well, we want to make sure that those of you trying to do entrepreneurship after taking these lessons and uh, learning about these things, hopefully with the tools that you have been able to get, you will not be in the group that fails. Hopefully you will have found projects which have a good chance of success. So I also want to uh, have a few quotes from a few other people, including uh, this is Paul Graham from Y Combinator. He established the world's first acceleration program um, in 2003. And he says, you know, making sure you don't fail is actually quite simple. As long as you build something people want and people here, customers want. As long as you're doing that, your probability of failure is going to go down tremendously. As a compliment to this, you know, or as a statement of the obvious, do not spend money, time, energy building something people do not want. So if there, if there is no customer for it, don't spend your resources doing it. Unfortunately, there's a lot of entrepreneurs that are doing exactly this. They're working on a project, spending a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of energy, a lot of resources, developing something which unfortunately and the, at the end of the day, people are not going to want. Uh, and when I talk to entrepreneurs that I mentor and I ask them, well, are you sure that there is a customer? Are you sure you're going to be able to sell this thing that, which you're trying to develop? Um, almost all of them say, yeah, 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 yeah. There is a customer, there will be a customer. I'm almost certain. 
So I kind of then uh, ask the question again, are you sure? How do you know? And do you have proof that there is a customer waiting for you? Uh, and they might say, well, I haven't completed it. I haven't tried to sell it. So how can I have proof? Only at that time will I have actual proof whether there is a customer or not. Well, my answer is that, no, you don't have to wait until you actually complete everything and try to sell to the customer to really find out. There are many tools that you can use much earlier in the process, even at the idea stage, which may actually help you prove or disprove whether there's actual demand. And if you look at some of my other presentations where I talk more about lean entrepreneurship and in particular about MVPs, these are things that you can use to generate proof without having to actually come up with the final uh, product or service. So, newborn baby, when you hear this, what comes to your mind? Well, pictures like this or, you know, beautiful, uh, pure, and so on might come to your mind. But in reality, newborn babies don't really look what you're seeing on screen. They look more like this or like this, or if it was a natural birth, the head is elongated and so on. So that's what real newborn babies look like. But for some reason, the parents and most of us tend to think of new or born babies as being something like this. Why? Because in order for mankind to survive, to continue its existence, that's how we need to see them, okay? And especially parents, when their babies are just born, they look at them and they see these cute little things. Why? Because in reality, they may not be that cute, but they're going to have to spend an awful lot of time um, not sleeping, cleaning diapers, uh, you know, neck deep and all of that work. And it's going to be an awful lot of work. And unless they see their babies like this, they may decide that it's not worth having <laughs> babies. And that would not be good for mankind. So for babies, this is a good thing. Now, why am I talking about newborn babies in an entrepreneurship presentation? Well, because there's quite a bit of similarity. The entrepreneurs and their ideas, especially when they're brand new and they're floating up in the air and you haven't actually started to do it, to do it they're like your babies. And just like with babies, uh, entrepreneurs often fail to see the weaknesses of their ideas. So the actual baby, the actual idea might be ugly, might be all sorts of problematic, but the entrepreneur doesn't see it, or if he or she starts to see it, they'll kind of sweep it under the rug. My job is to make sure that this doesn't happen. I want you to see your idea for what it really is. And for this, if I have to be the bad guy, that's all right, okay? But I want you to capture that idea that is floating up in the air, put it down onto paper where it's more difficult to lie to yourself. And then from there, take a nice long look at your business idea before you actually start finalizing it. And if your idea at this stage looks like, yes, this is something that can work, good, okay? Then you may start working on it, but still be careful because at this stage, all of those things that you've actually put down onto uh, paper, or we're going to uh, give you an, as, as an example, uh, business model in particular, we'll talk about the business model canvas. And if that business model canvas looks like your uh, idea uh, is going to survive or has a chance of survival, be careful because it simply means that if everything you wrote on that piece of paper ends up being correct, you have a chance of success. Unfortunately, many of the things on there will probably turn out to be mistaken, incorrect. So that's the next thing you're going to have to spend time on is checking all of those things that you've written down. Uh, you can call them your assumptions about your business model. For example, who's my customer? What are the things that my customer wants to do? What are the big problems that they're experiencing? How am I going to solve those problems? 
How much will it? Uh, how much time will it take to develop these products and services? How much will it cost? How much can I sell this for? Where should I sell this? Uh, all sorts of things that are in the business model that need to be checked out. Okay, so that's going to be the next step. But as a first step, start capturing the idea and get it down onto paper and look at it then. If it's bad at that stage, okay, you don't have to continue with that bad idea because I don't need any other information. But what you can try to do is make adjustments, make changes to the idea, change some things around, maybe the customers, maybe the problem that you're trying to address, maybe how you're going to solve it, maybe where you're going to sell it until you end up with an idea that has a chance of success. That's what you need to do. So let's take a look at our business model that we've talked about earlier. So the business model canvas developed by Alex, Alex Osterwalder in his PhD thesis is composed of nine parts, nine blocks. And uh, don't start from up here and going this way, okay? The two most important parts of the business model are the value proposition and the customer segments, okay? So that's where you should start from. Uh, and actually, I argue that you should start from customers, get to know them well, find their problems, and then find a way to solve these with your product, with your value proposition. But most people start out with an idea about a product. So they actually start out here. That's fine if that's what you want to do. But then quickly think about who's going to be using this for what purposes. So jump over here, spend a lot of time thinking about who your customers or your customer segments might be, understand them, talk with them, uh, do research about them. And once you truly understand them well, then jump back to your value proposition and check out, does my original idea still meet what I need to do for these customers? And which customers have the most uh, chance of success are going to be where I would like to begin. So your beachhead market, you don't attack your uh, your an enemy where they're strongest. You want to identify somewhere where their defense is weak, where there's a good market, which is being underserved. And that's where you want to attack. That's where you want to establish yourself. And then you may be able to expand into other areas as well. Uh, so then there's a lot more to think about the business idea, but those are the first things you should check. And what you're trying to find is make sure that you have a product market fit, okay? So they won't always fit 100%. Not all of the problems that uh, you think your customers have will be satisfied by your product. But uh, if they're totally missing each other, you definitely want to stop. You want to maybe make some changes. You want to have at least partial fit in that your product at least uh, satisfies some of the problems that your customers have. That may be sufficient. And then go on from there, continue from there. <clears throat> so this is the Turkish version, uh, which I have translated for the business model canvas, and you can find it at adloran.com. And here are some examples of innovations which different companies have made in their business models that brought them success. Uh, I'm not going to be talking all about all of these, but in particular, I'll be focusing on some of the innovations that occurred in the customer segments part of the business model. And I'll be using their examples and continuing from there. So customer segments. So we have, I, or I have chosen kind of these five to help us talk about uh, what kind of improvements you can make in your business model. But I also have Google and Yamexipit up here in the corner um, because they're a little different. They're interesting. Google, what are the customer segments that Google is serving? Who is the customer? Well, we tend to think that we are, right? The people that go there and conduct searches. And if you think about it, what is the product that Google has? What is it giving to us? What is its value proposition? A lot of people say information. Well, Google doesn't really produce new information. 
It gathers the information. It gets people to come to its website, ask questions. It understands what those questions are. It understands who you are and uses that to determine what you're actually looking for, then gives you easy access to that information from around the web. Okay, so that's typically what we think of as Google doing successfully. However, we don't pay for this, right? Google does this for free. So how does that make sense? What kind of a business model is this if it doesn't make money from it? Well, Google makes its money from somewhere else. It uh, has several sources, but its biggest source is ad revenue. So when you think of it, at the end of the day, Google's real customer isn't the individuals that are conducting searches and getting the results. They are the people advertising on Google. Hmm. So if I'm not Google's customer, I'm simply a user, you could also say that I am actually the product which Google is selling, marketing. The, the customers, the real customers of Google, the advertisers, are paying Google money to put things in front of my eyeballs, okay? So the search engine part is actually a side business of Google. Their real business is getting customers that they know a lot about to their website and then putting advertisements in front of us and making money from uh, the idea in that manner. So when you think of the business in this way, uh, we may actually you know, start seeing many different opportunities available in other places as well. So uh, there's a saying, I'm not sure who initially said this, but if you're using a product or a service and you are not paying for it, be very careful because more likely than not, you are the product. You're not the customer. So be aware of this. Well, what if you are paying for it? Does it mean you're the customer and you're not the product? Well, not always. Sometimes the fact that you're paying for something may actually make you an even better product. For example, if you pay for a magazine, let's say a computer magazine, magazines typically don't make most of their revenue from selling the magazine. A much bigger source often is the advertising in the magazines. So when you pay for an actual computer magazine, what you're basically telling them is, I'm interested in this subject enough so that I'm willing to pay for a magazine on the subject, which means that the advertisers that want to advertise things about computers and software, then they may uh, be willing to pay even more for my eyeballs. Okay, so keep that in mind. How about Yemeksepiti? Why is Yemeksepiti uh, say Yemeksepiti here? Well, they're actually a marketplace, bringing together restaurants and hungry people and making sure they interact. They're, they basically buy from each other and then they earn a commission from in between. But <clears throat> when you have two customers, which one is your real customer or are they of equal value? Oftentimes, one may be more important than the other. So is it the restaurants, which are the real customers of Yemeksepite, or is it the hungry individuals? Where might you notice the actual result of this? Well, for example, let's say that one of the hungry customers has a problem with the restaurant. The food doesn't arrive, or it's spoiled, or it's bad, something happens, and they write a real bad review about the restaurant. So the restaurant then comes back to Yemeksepite and says, please remove that review. It's making me lose business. Whether Yemeksepite removes that review or leaves it up there will give you a pretty good idea about who their customer really is. If they remove it, then the restaurant seems to be the real customer. But if they leave it up there for the other uh, hungry customers to be able to see and use in their decision-making, then it seems that the hungry customers are their main customers. And what we see is that the hungry customers seem to be Yemeksepite's main customer, especially now that they have such a large market share and market power, definitely the customers seem to dominate. 
Well, let's come down to these five and why are they here? I might not go into details of all of them, but in particular, let me talk a little bit about Volt Lines, which was a company begun by, um, which, which is a company that Ali Halabi, a Lebanese uh, expat working for Procter & Gamble, later leaves his work, his job, and establishes initially a company called Volt, just Volt. And basically he did this to try to tackle the traffic problem in Istanbul. He loved the city, but its traffic was horrible. So he tried to find ideas about how he might try to help. And one uh, way to do this was, well, what if I could find a, uh, a group of customers which were willing to share their vehicles and reduce the number of cars in traffic? So he tried to tackle it with ride sharing where uh, if I'm driving my car from here to here, I put this information up on an app and people that want to also ride in that direction at the same time may be able to use my car and they would be able to share the cost of this so both sides could benefit. That was the idea. And uh, he even had some investors and was actually you know, spending a lot of money developing both the app and trying to get customers. And again, here, again, it's a two-sided market. You have the drivers and you have the riders. So he needed to have both to have a good marketplace. Unfortunately, he, was, uh, he had to deal with a lot of problems. And at the end of the day, he decided that he didn't have enough volume to be able to make this into a successful idea. But from the research that he had done in this area, he noticed that there was actually another potential problem related to traffic that he could tackle or another solution that had more potential. So he shut down the Volt company, Volt app, and then he started Volt Lines. Because when talking to businesses and CEOs, he had seen that they basically had the same problem. They didn't want their people to use ride sharing individually, but a lot of the employees working in these companies, and especially the ones in Istanbul working in these large uh, big buildings where many companies are actually working together, packed quite closely. A lot of their uh, employees were taking the buses, service, uh, which the company was paying for. But a lot of these were not at full capacity. So a lot of the mini buses and buses were only half full and they were still paying for all of it. So they said, well, would you mind if your employees shared the, their buses with other people. So that was the idea behind Volt Lines. And together with some technology and so on, they were able to start this. And thanks to the greater capacity usage, they were able to offer this service cheaper than the alternatives, uh, thanks to better capacity usage. And also, for example, if you don't want to go to your own house today as you're leaving work, what if you want to go to a concert in taxi? Well, with Volt Lines, this is possible because you go onto the app, you say, okay, I actually want to go here tonight. Is there room on that minibus? If there is, I reserve my spot. Oh, where is it going to start from and so on? And I'm able to keep track of all of this. How long will the ride take? When will I get there? All of that information can be reached. So he got a new investment for this, and now this is going pretty successfully. He's expanded outside of Istanbul as well, and also has begun to expand internationally, especially in the Middle East. So things are going well. So this was an example of changing the customer segment from kind of peer-to-peer -peer or C2C kind of business marketplace to a B2B business where his customers now are the companies which are hiring the buses for their employees to use. Another example of a company which kind of innovated in the customer segment was Parachute and its accounting software or kind of uh, ERP also software to a certain degree. Uh, there were a lot of accounting software companies in Turkey, but most of these were targeted at the uh, medium to large businesses, and they were pretty expensive and pretty detailed. Um, but what 
who wasn't using them were the small and especially the micro companies because it was too expensive and too much work for them. So when Parashut decided to get into this business, they said, we're going to target a different customer segment. And they said, we're not going for the big or even for the medium-sized companies or even the relatively larger of the small group. They said, we're going to target the micro the companies that have, you know, 10 or less employees. And we're going to provide them with accounting software, but it's going to be software as a service. And we're going to keep this on the cloud and they're going to be able to use it. And it's going to be relatively cheap at uh, originally, I think it was something like 35 liras per month, uh, similar to what you would pay for a phone bill. And as a result, because they're kind of coming down with the prices and towards the many companies, which are micro companies, something like about 95% of companies by number are actually micro sized, 10 uh, employees or less. So there's a huge number of these, but they're all relatively small. So that was what they were targeting. And obviously, if you were targeting the large companies, you would have site visits, you would have salespeople going to them, trying to sell to them the expensive software. But for micro companies, the way that you're going to sell them and the customer acquisition cost and so on has to be very different. So they only uh, get to them via email or via phone call. And that's how they need to get their customers in order to make this into a profitable business. So going to the uh, towards the bottom of our pyramid, where we have many more companies, but their budgets might be much more limited, it might be another way to uh, try to become a profitable company. Um, the other one I will talk about is Ford here. And Ford actually in my business model, I have them in the cost structure because what Ford did around 1900 is they were able to, uh, thanks to the moving production line, uh, they were able to cut the amount of time that it takes to build one car from around 15 hours to less than one and a half hours. So what this meant was by cutting down that time, they also cut down on the cost of building those cars. So that was a big improvement in the cost structure. But what this allowed was them uh, to be able to reach another customer segment. Up until that time, these vehicles had mainly been the you know, toys of the rich and the very rich. But thanks to this, Ford was able to produce its famous Ford Model T. And because the cost had come down significantly, they were able to still make money at a much lower selling price as well. So uh, by making this car and they standardized all of the production and they were able to bring the cost down, which allowed them to profitably sell the cars to lower down in the pyramid. And as a result, they became a hugely successful company by changing a lot of things, including their customer segment. So these are some examples. <clears throat> now, what I want to make sure that everybody is aware of is that customers are not the same. Just like individuals come in different sizes, in different shapes, different genders, and so on. Um, if you want to satisfy them well, you shouldn't treat them as if they are all identical. Okay, so both men and women, we come in different shapes, different sizes, and so on. Uh, and you need to be very well aware that one size does not fit all. If you try to give everybody a standardized product, like a t-shirt, well, for some people, that t-shirt may be huge, you know, flow, uh, overflowing, and, uh, you know, like a dress. But for some people, it's going to be so tight, they can't even put it on. So the only people you will be satisfying will be the average people, okay? And outside of that, you will have a lot of customers which are not satisfied with your product. If you're targeting only that middle part of the market, the average, okay, you may be uh, able to have a business. But you have to be aware that the non-standard part of your customer base is probably not going to be satisfied 
and they're not going to be your customers. Well, you may argue that, well, if I look at the distribution, most, the majority of the customers will be around that average. So let's, uh, I have an example about, you know, an online t-shirt store. Let's say you want to open something like this up and uh, you have enough money for 1, 000, to buy 1,000 t-shirts for this season. And you're not going to be able to order again because it takes too long and so on. But one decision you need to make is, let's say that you have one color which you think is going to be in style this year. And uh, again, you have enough money for 1,000 t-shirts. So what size are you going to get those shirts? Well, you might say, I need information about you know, the distribution of sizes of individuals. Because if you tell me what the average is, typically, uh, and if I also know the standard deviation around that, well, I know that plus or minus one standard deviation around the mean, typically that's about two thirds of the population. People will be there. And if the size I choose is that average size, then I should be able to capture a hey, two thirds of the market, right? Well, yeah. And if you go out plus or minus two standard deviations, that's about 95% of the population. If you go out three, that's more than 99% of the population that you have been able to capture. So you might say, hmm, well, then I'll order of the 1,000, maybe 500, I'll order uh, medium. Uh, maybe 200 plus 200 small and medium, and then maybe 50 extra small and 50 extra large. Does that sound good? Well, if you were the first online t-shirt store, yeah, I, I think that might be adequate. But the problem is there's probably a lot of, a lot of t-shirt sellers, both offline in brick and mortar shops and also online. So you have a lot of competition and going for the mass market, going for that you know, big part of the body of that distribution, there's a lot of competition there, okay? And if you're of average build, average size, ask yourself this, how difficult is it for an average person to find what they're looking for. When they walk into any store, can they find the t-shirts that they're looking for in their size? Typically, yes. It's very easy for them to find shirts that fit them. But how about people that are more at the extremes? If you're extra large or extra small, or heaven forbid, extra, extra large or extra, extra small, when you go into a store, is it usually easy or difficult for you to find clothes that fit you. The extra extra large and extra extra small, for them, it's much more difficult to find what they're looking for. The, the stores might actually uh, have a few shirts or t-shirts in their size, but oftentimes they will sell out pretty quickly. So, uh, especially if it's not the beginning of the season, you might find it difficult. You might have to go to a lot of stores or you might not be able to find things that fit you at all. So what I've been describing actually is a customer segment, which is different than the average and whose needs are currently not being well met in the market. This is an excellent opportunity for a new small business to use as their starting point, as their beachhead market. So my advice might be, rather than attack your market from where it is strongest in the middle, you might actually say, hmm, the customers which are not very satisfied and might be willing to go online for their shopping and wait to receive their t-shirts maybe a few days, might be the ones that currently have difficulty finding them. And also you're not located to a single geographic location, your store is online, okay? So as long as you can make your customers aware that you have these shirts in these interesting sizes, you may be able to get them and satisfy them 
And uh, the best thing about a satisfied, happy customer is that they can buy from you again and again and again as long as they're happy. Okay, so you are able to keep those customers. And once more, uh, this normal distribution, does it actually fit in to the uh, t-shirt sizes? Well, the wonder of the internet is you can actually find information like this as well. So at least this tends to show us that, well, maybe the mean of the distribution, at least for men, doesn't seem to be medium. It's actually large. Well, it, this may also depend on the country, obviously. But here, what we're actually seeing is that the, the kind of set middle point of the distribution seems to be large. And around that, yes, we do have some type of curve, which is kind of coming down with small and double XL kind of being in the extremes with nine and 10% and medium and XL kind of coming down a little bit and being about 23% each. So this might be the information you actually need to order your t-shirts, but again, rather than go for kind of the medium part or the medium, large, extra large mass market or main part of the market, it might actually make more sense to kind of look at the double XL or the small, or if you really want to, extra small and maybe triple XL in your online t-shirt store where you can find customers which currently in the marketplace are not happy with the offerings and may be willing to come to your store and become a loyal customer if you can serve them well. So keeping that in mind. What are the benefits of segmenting your potential customers? Well, the biggest one is once you're able to separate them out, and better see what they're trying to do and where they're having problems by choosing some of these uh, and developing products, pick especially for what they need, what they want, you're able to focus better and as a result, better serve those customer segments. Uh, obviously, this is going to make you more competitive to your customers, which are going out with a more vanilla or average product. So you'll be more competitive. Uh, don't forget that just because you start there doesn't mean you have to stay there. This is the beachhead market where you're initially establishing yourselves. And then, yeah, maybe you will expand into the other sizes, other markets as well. And uh, if, especially if you can develop a, a name for yourself and a reputation, this may help you in the other markets as well. Uh, increased customer retention. So this means the customer is coming back to you again and again, or if it's a subscription service, continuing to be your customer. This helps you make more money from the given customers. So again, a happy customer is a loyal customer and will buy from you many times over. Um, improved timing. If you know the customer well, you know where they will be, when they will be there, when they actually want to purchase, and you may go out and find them match with them more easily. And you may also, if you understand them well, you have an idea about what their budget is, how much it costs to make this, how much they are willing to pay. So you may also optimize on price to maximize your profits. So these are some of the benefits of customer segmentation. And obviously it's not just about knowing your customer and satisfying them. It's also about now when I want to advertise to them, right? When I want to let them know about my new product, if I know who they are, if I know where they live, if I know what TVs and channels or search words they use, I can reach them more easily as well. So a lot of benefits to knowing your customers well. Um, how, what different types of customer segments can you have? Well, the mass market is when you basically say the entire market is pretty similar. So I'm going to produce one product and sell it to everyone. This is a possibility, especially if there are very large economies of scale to take advantage of. Like the example for Ford in 1900. 
uh, Henry Ford was able to develop the Ford Model T and you know, cut the production time to about 10% of what it was. And as a result, was able to cut the costs and as a result, lower the price of the standard product and sell to many, many people. Okay, So that's a mass market where economies of scale can help you capture a big chunk of that market. But for a small startup, typically, that's not where you want to go because there's a lot of competition typically in that mainstream market. So you might want to look for a niche market, a relatively small market, which is still big enough for you to survive and grow in and maybe uh, extend to other markets. But a niche is when you identify a customer segment or a market segment, which is different than the rest of the market and whose needs are currently not being well met. And that's an excellent place to initially attack. Uh, a segmented market is when you're able to identify different markets, market segments, and you develop different products or different versions of your product for the different segments. This is a possibility, but typically this customization requires a lot of resources, which you might not have as a startup, as a new young company. A diversified uh, market is when you choose different market segments in very unrelated fields. A good example of this might be Amazon. Amazon, in addition to uh, selling all sorts of goods online, they also make a lot of money from something called AWS, okay? So this is when they provide Amazon Web Services to other customers for them to use their infrastructure, computer server infra infrastructure in their own businesses. And currently a, a very big chunk of the revenues and profits, especially of Amazon comes from this business. It's not related to selling online, it's now selling uh, computer uh, storage and computer processing power to other customers. Uh, the relation is that they developed an ability to do this well for their own e-business, e-retail. And now that they've developed this, they're able to use that uh, accumulated knowledge to be able to do this for other companies as well. And it, it's been a great source of revenue for them. And then finally, uh, multi-sided platforms or markets, or you might call these marketplaces. These are where you have you know, the sellers and the buyers and you bring them together and then you earn a commission from in between. This might also be a, a way to identify your customer segments and serve them well. When is it best to use market segments rather than treat them as one big block? Well, especially if the needs of the different segments are different or can be met uh, through different products or services, that's a good opportunity. If they can be reached through different channels, okay? So for example, if you're a bank and you uh, are thinking of customers, let's say my father, me, and my son, do you think that we can be reached through the same channels? Uh, for example, my dad has never used online banking or uh, smartphone apps for banking. Whereas my son has been in a bank, I think, once up to today. Okay. And then me, I'm kind of in between. Sometimes I go to the branch, but mostly the branch doesn't want me going in because I don't make a lot of money for the bank. So they would rather that I use the ATM or online or smartphone app for my banking service. So, uh, you know, if they forced all of us to use online banking and advertise to us on Google and other places, uh, I dare them to uh, be able to capture my father as a potential customer. Okay, my son, yeah, you'd probably be able to reach him, me, possibly, but my dad and people similar to him, uh, but you really need to reach us via different channels. So if they need different customer relations, again, the example of my dad, myself, and my son, 
we probably need different levels of customer relations. I'm happy to do it online or via the ATM, but my dad wants to physically talk with a real individual, wants to have his um, bank booklets uh, processed and everything written down so that he can actually see it. And significant differences in profitability. Well, the reason that my dad is able to get that high level of customer relations service is that he has a lot more money in the bank compared to myself. And as a result, the profitability of his account compared to me or to my son is significantly higher. So again, uh, these types of differences are good reasons to be able to segment the markets into portions, understand them, and serve them in a way that they're satisfied and that they're willing to pay. Uh, if they're willing to pay for different characteristics of product services, again, then you may break it up. And for example, now there are some banks which don't have branches at all. In Turkey, uh, for example, Enpara is trying to do this, right? So, and uh, especially people that are young are don't, don't really want to go into a branch, uh, into a bank branch. So they're more than happy to do this online 100%. And uh, as long as it's cheaper, as long as it's useful for them, they're happy to do it in that manner. What else? Well, let's say you want to segment. According to what am I going to segment my market? These are the four most popular and kind of oldest ways to segment the market. Demographic uh, segmentation, or you might say, okay, who is my customer? So you may define them according to their age, according to their religion, race, gender, education level, ethnicity, income. These are all typical demographic characteristics that we use to try to separate the market. And sometimes they work, sometimes not so much. What else can I use? Well, how about geographic segmentation? Um, sometimes I have students come in and they say, I have an idea. Okay, who's the customer? University students. And I tell them, what do you mean university students? And I say, first of all, they're very different. How about uh, private university students versus state university students? How about university students that are in Istanbul versus Ankara? versus in Van, versus in Izmir, versus in a little city, right? Are these all similar? For most purposes, no, they're actually quite different. And then I can even come in more. Uh, university students, let's say in Ankara, let's say at Ottu, are they all the same? Just looking around at the other students in my typical class, they typically come back and say, yeah, yeah, you know, university students is too broad. I need to change this. Are they living in Ankara with their families? Are they staying in the dorms? Do they have a car? How much money do they have? How many brothers do they have? All of these can make huge differences to the customers and what they want, what they need. So demographic, geographic, according to country, city, area, or region, these are typically used, especially if you're going to have a physical store, definitely in your uh, customer segment identification, you probably want to be focusing on your geographic region or a psychographic kind of mix some things together. So it includes things like your social stat status, your lifestyle, you know, are you a yuppie? Are you kind of a, uh, you know, hippie type of individual are you you know what are you trying to do are you a uh, newly employed or are you unemployed all of these make up your psychographic uh, what type of attitudes do you have are you you know a big capitalist or are you saying no we need to save the world and the environment and so on so these can make big differences and sometimes your hobbies what else do we have behavioral so, for example, if you're a heavy consumer of a particular product, if you use it very heavily, or if you've never bought something, or you've bought it many times before, if you're loyal to a brand, or what kind of things do you expect to have? Or sometimes it's simply, it's the beginning of the month, I've just gotten paid, or I'm at the checkout. You know, These will affect your buying decisions. 
So they can be used for segmentation in that manner as well. So the demographics is about who is your customer. The geographic segmentation is about where is your customer. Psychographic segmentation is about, you know, why could they be your customer? And behavioral uh, is about, you know, how, how are they behaving and how might this affect whether they want to be your customer or not, what they want, what they don't want. Newer additions to segmentation, you might run into these, technographic, generational and life segmentation, transactional segmentation, and firmographic. Technographic is about how are they with technology? Are they heavy users of smartphones or are they the type of individual that has to have the latest technology? So that is about their technographic approach. And you might want to segment according to this. Or generational, you know, what generation are they from? Or sometimes a little independent of their generation, at what life stage are they? Are they uh, single? Are they married? Uh, do, do they have children? Do they have young children? Do they have, you know, uh, children in school? Uh, are they divorced? All of these uh, may affect what they need and you know, their budgets and what they're looking to buy by very large amounts. So knowing about these can be very beneficial in segmentation again. Transactional segmentation, you want to know about what they're uh, doing right now, what they've done in the past. Have they bought from the company before? Is it the first time they're coming to your store? What have they bought from you before? How much do they have currently in their um, checkout uh, bin? For example, if they have you know, 180 liras worth of goods in their box and you know, they're, they're shopping, they're almost going to check out, up pops a little balloon and says, hey, if you buy more than 200 liras worth of goods, you can get free shipping or overnight shipping, okay? And trying to get them to buy a little more. So these might be transactional segmentation that you're applying to them. Firmographic segmentation is more about the B2B market. For example, if your customer is uh, working in a small business or a large business, or if they're from a particular industry, and especially if it's, you know, the uh, if they're making the purchases for their company, all of these may be very valuable information for you to uh, offer them different products or different pricing or different you know, characteristics of the product. So knowing these may help you understand your customer better and also serve them better. And obviously, these are not necessarily independent. You can use combinations of these to help you out. So hybrids, a little demographic with technographic and so on to better understand your customers. So for demographics, you might have seen things like this. You might sometimes say, oh, you know, upper class, middle class, lower class. Or here they have upper, upper, lower, upper, 1% and 2%, then upper, middle, lower, middle. As you're coming down, it's a pyramid. So it's kind of, you know, gets fatter. And then down at the bottom here, uh, you know, from country to country, this may differ. And where their cutoffs may also differ. But... Uh, here, their middle class seems to be fat, whereas in Turkey, the bottom of this definitely would be fatter. Uh, we have, you know, more than 50% of our population making minimum wage. So uh, that's going to be a very fat bottom to the triangle. But understanding these and how education, occupation and other things also change in this. So here's a slightly different version of this where they use kind of letters to describe the uh, parts of the market segments, of the customer segments. So upper is A and B, managerial, administrative, professional uh, individuals. And then, you know, top managers, they mentioned. And then intermediate managerial, administrative, or professional kind of coming a little down, making a little less money. And this also would affect where they live, uh, what size of a house they have, what type of cars they buy, what type of clothes they wear, and so on. 
So understanding these and what percentages and where you can find them, how you can reach them, how you can advertise to them and so on, this is going to be very important in making your business a success. So try to understand them well. And what you're trying to reach at the end is personas. So uh, this is your idea about who your potential customers are. And you want to define them in a way so that by the summary that you're offering me, I can understand what are the important characteristics of this customer segment and what do they need and what the type of a product can I develop for them. And the best persona would be something that allows me, as I'm walking down the street, I see somebody coming across and I can say, hey, that's my customer. That's my customer. Okay. If you can develop such a good understanding, or that's definitely not my customer, obviously, is also going to be in there. So, what kind of things do we have in personas? If possible, you know, try to form a picture or find a picture from a magazine or online to help you define what kind of person. So, this is not necessarily an individual, it is representative of a group of customers. And hopefully you also have an idea about how many or how big this customer segment is. So in this example, Rachel is a stay-at-home mo mother and, you know, 40 years old, married, two children, lives uh, in Sydney. And uh, what kind of education? She's worked before, right now might not be working. What's the husband doing? What's their life like? And now their uh, pain, their challenges. High mortgage gives little spare cash, so they don't have a lot of budget to spend. Need to downsize and reduce the mortgage, especially if their children are going to be leaving the house and so on. Sell the property at a good price in a bad market. How can they do this? Could you potentially help out with this? It might be a good opportunity. Where do they go for information? Well, they use a lot of internet and they're also on different social media, okay? So this gives you a lot of information about the customer, who they are, what they're trying to do, what type of problems they have. And then you get to decide, well, what sorts of products can I develop to help serve these, to sell to these types of people? Or something like this, you know, Brandy Tyler. So uh, in their profile, narrow feet. I wonder why I need that information. Could it be because my product idea is about shoes? So this might be valuable information for, for me. So a person, a female with narrow feet, age 36, living in uh, the US in Los Angeles, making about 38,000 per year. And then, you know, what are they trying to accomplish? What are their goals? What are their problems that they're experiencing? And then how might I be able to capture Brandy and people like Brandy as my customers? Try to develop ideas. And more, you know, if I was looking for uh, potential customers to my coffee shop, could Sarah student be a potential customer? Okay. So information about Sarah, the student, or information about Kyle Fisher. Okay. A potential uh, SUV buyer. Okay. Who is he? What does he do? What does he want from a car? Why might he want us an SUV? How much budget might he have? What are things that he's not happy with? Okay. And again, you know, a marketing manager, John Johnson, you know, how old, what education, what's he trying to do? What are his problems and so on? So good personas. These are examples that you can find from around the internet. Uh, hopefully you'll be able to develop your own personas. Other things that you want to know is what is the customer journey and who are the people that affect the final decision? So here, this cartoon kind of helps us understand the, uh, for example, if you're uh, that kid and you want to buy a new, uh, let's say, Xbox. So that is the end user. How many children are there? You know, uh, how many of them want an Xbox versus something else? But again, be careful because the kid might not be the person making the final buying decision. Just like in companies, in companies, you really need to understand this better because the oftentimes the end user isn't the one making the final decision about buying the product. 
So you might be interviewing the end user. Let's say you have some new uh, ERP software or inventory management software. You talk with the inventory, the person responsible for the warehouse for the inventory. And you know they tell you about this big problem that they have. But you fail to notice, or after the interview, you say, hey, I found a great problem. I'm going to solve this. I'm going to make a lot of money. But later, you actually learn that the person in charge of that inventory manager, uh, who's going to make the decision about what to buy, what not to buy, says that, hey, you know, it's his job. Yeah, it takes him three hours per day, but he has the full day. I don't pay him that much. And so it's not a problem if he spends that much time doing this particular thing. That's what I pay him for. Uh, in which case, the thing that was a problem for the end user isn't really a big problem for the company. And as a result, if you produce that software, it might not be bought by this company. You need to understand this. So not only the end user and the, the buyer, but also sometimes you have people that may uh, don't make the final decision, but they may decide, no, this year, the accounting department says we have no budget for anything. Okay, so they veto any purchase decisions for this period. And then you have people which are influencers, which kind of have views about, you know, what should be bought, should we buy it at all, or what are the alternatives. And then everybody always needs a champion. Who are the people that might convince, you know, the company or the individuals that buying your product makes a lot of sense? Again, you might have some champions, and, and then you might have some people that are the heavy resistance. So understand all of these, especially if you're planning on a B2B business, because B2B typically takes much longer and there's many more people involved in the process. A typical purchase for a company, six months would be quick. Okay, So don't expect to go in today and sell tomorrow to a company, to especially large companies. And here's a little extra information about B2B versus B2C, business to business versus business to consumer. Uh, consider the structure of the market. How many competitors do you have? What kind of products do they have? Uh, how many companies are there which are demanding, uh, which are buying from this market? What type of things do they have? What are the prices? Typically in a B2B market, you will have fewer and larger buyers compared to the consumer market. So keep in mind, there might only be 100 customers in this market, but each of them might be buying a million units each year. So uh, selling to fewer people, but if you capture just one or two customers, that might make a huge difference in your sales revenue and in your profits. So be aware of this. Sometimes the demand isn't directly for the product, but because they want to produce or sell something else, they may need what you're selling. Like, especially if you have machinery to build something, to make something, or to help them sell something. So it might be some type of derived demand that uh, you have to consider. Inelastic demand is demand which doesn't change much depending on the prices. So even if you double the price, the quantity demanded doesn't change very much. So in these types of markets, if you're able to increase the price, that definitely will increase your revenues. But be careful if there's a lot of competition. Typically, it's not inelastic if they switch immediately to your comp competition. Um, there may be markets where the demand is fluctuating, especially with economic conditions. So you need to understand these markets well. And uh, typically in B2B businesses, once a company starts buying from a business, they tend to stay with that business for a long time. So uh, there will be these relationships that develop and they become dependent on each other. And uh, again, it's a long-term relationship. So make sure that that relationship is managed well and that uh, nobody gets upset and decides to make big changes. Longer and more complex buying cycles, yes. It's not, I go in to sell something today and I finish the sale the next day. It doesn't happen that way. Typically, at least six months, sometimes it might take years to uh, be able to sell something to a company, especially to big companies. So 
be aware of all of these. Other things that you might want to use, in addition to the business model canvas, uh, Osterwalder and Strategizer, they've also developed the value proposition canvas, which focuses on two of those blocks we talked about, the customer segments and the value proposition. And in particular with the customer, it breaks it up, not just into who is this customer, but what are the jobs to be done of this customer? help them understand them, and what are the gains, the advantages that the customer wants to reach, wants to have, and what are the pains? I think I especially like to focus on this part because these are the problems that the company has, that the customer has, and these are the things that you want to solve. These are the things you want to provide. So which of these are you going to be able to uh, accomplish? So slightly closer look. So what kind of jobs, functional, social, emotional, what are the basic needs and, you know, what roles do they play? Take a look at these, but especially, you know, what are the pains that they have? And when discussing this with customers, be careful because when they say, oh, it takes a long time, what do they mean by a long time? Oh, it's very expensive. What is expensive? Is it 50, 100, you know, 200, uh, too long? What does it mean? We want to become more efficient. What percent? So uh, what they're saying and what you're understanding might be different. So in the interviews, you want to be careful to make sure you understand what they're telling you very well and the gains that they want to have by using your product. So uh, think about all of these in defining your customer segments. So that concludes my talk about the customer segments of the business model canvas. So I hope it's been useful and I hope it's given you a lot of ideas about how to define your customers and make sure that then you go out and you check your assumptions, making sure that you are correct and then choosing which one you're going to target, which one you're going to attack and hopefully be successful. So that's going to be it for me. I'll see you back in class next week.